Well, good morning. I'm Peter Ratcliffe here at the Eastside Freedom Library. You may have been expecting to see Christy, but she's on vacation. And I'm the co-executive director here at the library. And I wanted to tell you about these two great writers and readers who are filling in for Christy this week. We have the very special treat for you this week that the authors of the books are also going to read them themselves. So we're going to start out this morning with a new book about Pittsburgh, a place that I used to live, by Nicole McCandless called Down on James Street. And this is a story about teenagers in Pittsburgh in the 1930s who have an integrated dance that, believe it or not, gets broken up by the police. So Nicole is going to read her own story. Stay tuned. All right. Illustrated by Byron Gramby. This book is dedicated to all the kids who are still dancing and still fighting for justice. The moon lit the riverbank, giving George a clear path to James Street. He was a member of the Young Workers League, which was hosting a dance that night. The same moon lit the steep hill that Dorothy strolled down. She'd heard about a dance on James Street and was ready to Lindy Hop. George picked up the pace as he heard a soft rat-a-tat, 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 tat. Dorothy heard it too and gave a twirl, testing out her new dress. Rat-a-tat, 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 tat. Two hands reached for the door of the dance hall. George pulled back hoping the darkness would hide his burning cheeks. I'm Dorothy, do you have a dance partner, she asked. Do I need one, George shrugged. Dorothy laughed and held open the door. All the best dances have partners, she said. Well, in that case, would you like to dance, he asked. Dorothy grabbed George's hand and pulled him into the crowd. George hadn't realized how many kids would be there. It was packed wall to wall. Everyone they passed smiled and waved at Dorothy. People stopped dancing to say hello to her. George pulled at his shirt collar. Surprised, he'd agreed to Lindy Hop with someone so popular. He was going to make a fool out of himself at his first dance. He tried to wipe his sweaty palms on his pants as casually as he could. Dorothy dragged him to the middle of the floor. Are you ready? Um, she flashed him a wide smile. We can watch the other kids if you need a minute. George nodded. It was getting easier to understand why everyone seemed to like Dorothy. Her confidence was uplifting and she was clearly kind. He took a deep breath. He lindy hopped a few times, but just to amuse his little sister and never in front of a crowd. He needed to pay attention to what was happening on the dance floor so he didn't screw this up. The kids all had style, shine shoes and suit jackets, rimmed hats and twisting skirts. Wait, did that girl have a fox around her neck? Did that one have a flower pot on her head? A boy flew by who looked like a checkerboard. He was twirling a girl who looked like a peacock. He couldn't wait to tell his little sister about these outfits, the moves, the music. That is, if he could trust her not to snitch to mom and dad. How do people afford these fancy clothes, George asked earnestly. My mama made mine from a flower bag. Dorothy gave another spin. And I bet a lot of the dresses in here are made from feed bags. Feed bags? George got distracted, imagining farm animals in fancy dresses. Enough gawking, let's dance, Dorothy yelled over the music. Snake hip, Suzy Q, shim, sham, a ring a fling, a ring a fling, a ring a fling, zing. George closed his eyes and listened to the beat. A boom, a bam, a boom, boom, bam. Now we got it. Ready to lift? Just don't drop me, Dorothy said. George gulped and nodded. Bend the knees, push up, frog jump, rat a tat, rat a tat, rat a tat, tat. Dorothy was smiling and laughing when she landed back on the ground. You're getting the hang of it now. Want to take a break and grab some water? George nodded and they headed to the back. How come I haven't seen you around before? Everyone seems to know you. Dorothy narrowed her eyes at him. We aren't exactly allowed to hang out in the same places, are we? Oh, right. George tapped his foot. He put his hands in his pockets, then took them out again, suddenly unsure of what to do with them. He wished he hadn't asked Dorothy such a foolish question. We are both allowed to be members of the Young Workers League though, said George. I'm considering joining, but I don't think my parents would approve. George leaned against the wall. I haven't told my parents yet I'm a member. I don't think they'd understand. Well, what would they think of you dancing with me? George ran his hands through his hair and thought about it. 
they probably wouldn't understand that either. The world is changing whether our parents like it or not. You're such a good dancer. You ever think about dancing in a contest, said George. My dream is to go to New York one day and dance at the Savoy Ballroom. Wow, all the way to New York? I've never even been across the Allegheny River. George gestured back to the dance floor. Should we try again? I think I'm getting better. Dorothy winked at him. You have a good teacher. An hour later, a ring of kids gathered around Dorothy and George as they flew across the floor. Soon, they were the only two dancing, dancing with others cheering them on. The kids clapped and stomped their feet to the music. Dorothy's confidence was contagious and George was throwing her higher and jumping faster. George felt light and free as he twisted and twirled his way across the room. Rat-a-tat, 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 tat. Hacksaw, hip lift, peel away, boom, slide, drag, dig, bam, 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 around the world and whip. Suddenly, there came a bang. Police officers filled the doorway to the dance hall. The officer in front pointed right at Dorothy and George. This dance is being shut down due to blacks and whites dancing together, he bellowed. George looked over at Dorothy. Officers began knocking kids over and shoving them against the wall. Some were carrying clubs. George saw an officer use his club to bash a kid in the back of the knees. The kid screamed and toppled over. George froze. He was used to police helping kids cross the street outside his school, not attacking them. These police officers were twice the size as most of the kids at the dance. Run, came a voice from the back. Kids began to scatter. Dorothy grabbed George's hand again and pulled him out the back door. Thump, thump, thump went their feet down James Street. They got a few blocks away and hid, below, hid low behind some bushes. They saw a few more kids run past them. One had blood dripping down his face. Another was limping. This isn't right, George said. He looked down at his feet. He felt afraid and ashamed. You don't have to tell me. This is a regular part of my life. Dorothy ducked lower as an officer ran by. Well, it shouldn't be. What are you going to do about it? What do you mean? You said it isn't right, so what are you going to do about it? I, I don't know. The police shut it down. What else can we do? We can't let them stop us from dancing. I have an idea, said Dorothy. The police are less likely to bother you than me. Run down the side streets and grab all the kids you can find. Tell them to come to my house at the top of the hill. Before George could respond, Dorothy was gone. His shoulders sank as he slowly headed back towards the main road. He'd never been confronted by the police before and his hands trembled. George considered his options. He could go home and pretend this night never happened. He thought of the police officers as they raised their clubs to innocent kids. No, he'd never forget this night. He could go home and explain what happened to his parents. Maybe they would know the right thing to do. There were a few problems with this plan. Firstly, his parents thought he was staying over at his friend Ricky's and didn't even know he was at a dance. And secondly, he'd never heard his parents talk about segregation. George couldn't remember a time in his whole life that he saw his parents interacting with a black person unless that person was a worker. Their church, the stores they shopped at, their school, it was all white people. He was going to need to talk to his parents about segregation, but he didn't have time to go home and do that just then. He needed to act now. He could try going to the police and reasoning with him himself. What would he say? You need to stop enforcing a bad law? George kicked the curb in frustration. No, 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 that wasn't right either. George froze as he saw a police officer running in his direction. He'd gotten into fights with neighborhood boys before and defended himself pretty well, but he never fought with a grown man. As fear pulsed through his body, George, from his fingers down to his toes, the officer ran by him. George's cheeks burned red. If it had been Dorothy there on the corner and not him, what would have happened? He had been at the dance. He had been breaking the law by dancing with Dorothy. Why did the police officer run right past him? George had to decide. He could keep walking straight and head back home or he could turn left back to James Street. He thought about how Dorothy was willing to risk everything for what was right. To fight back against racism and violence, she did that despite the consequences for her being far worse than for George. He knew what he needed to do. Thump, thump, thump went George's feet back towards James Street. He whispered into all the dark alleyways. Hey, we're going to Dorothy's at the top of the hill. Kids popped out from behind garbage cans and slid out of doorways. Someone jumped down from a fire escape and another rolled out from under a car. 
It wasn't long before George was making his way up the hill with a big group of kids. The moon had gone behind the clouds, giving them the shadows they needed. And then they heard it. Rat-a-tat, rat-a-tat, rat-a-tat-tat. Dorothy burst onto the front porch just in time to see the pack of the kids reaching the top of the hill. She smiled at the sight of them. She put on her hands on her hips and yelled out to the crowd. We all know that separate isn't equal. We aren't going to let them stop us from dancing. Come inside and let's hop. The kids cheered and filed into Dorothy's living room. As George scanned the room for Dorothy, he felt someone grab his hand. What do you think of my daddy's band? They sound great. We should ask them to play at the next dance. You really want to come to another one after the night we had? As long as you're there to dance with me. Dorothy gave George a gentle nudge on the shoulder. Thanks for gathering everyone up. George nudged her back. Thanks for saving the dance and thanks for doing the Lindy hop with me. Want to try again? Yes, but this time I'm going to lead. And with that, Dorothy swung George onto the floor. The end. Well, hi again. Here it is, Peter again. And uh, I'm here to introduce the second book and the second reader that you're going to hear from today. And that is Alejandra Domenzane, who's from California, although she grew up in Mexico, and her children's book, For All, and in Spanish, Paro Todos. And this is a story about a little girl and her father who come to California and struggle to find economic and social security. Stay tuned for Alejandra. This is a story of a girl named Flor, why she came to this land and what happened before. Her country was right next to this one and yet it seemed just as far as you could possibly get. Flor learned from TV about life on that side, staring in wonder with eyes open wide. People there, it appeared, owned oh so much stuff, while for her there was usually never enough. When she saw TV shows that had Christmas with snow, kids opening gifts in the trees, cozy glow, she dreamt of bright gifts piled high on the floor. When you thought you were done, there was always one more. As she put on her clothes and combed her black hair, she'd chat with her dad about life over there. Do you know they have so many dresses and shoes that they're late every day because it's so hard to choose? Flora dreamt of that place where if you had sorrow, you always believed in the hope of tomorrow, where the endings were happy and teeth gleamed so white, no one was hungry and the law made things right. One day her dad said, Flor, we're leaving our land. The fields have all turned into dust and dry sand. We cannot grow corn with so little water. Our land cannot feed us, my dear darling daughter. Can't you find other work? Get a job in a factory? I've tried, said her dad. It was unsatisfactory. The machines and the chemicals fill me with fear. At work, mom got sick after only a year. I couldn't save her, but can save you, my dear. You're all that I have, and I can't raise you here. Are we going to the land that we see on TV? Will we fly in a plane? Will there be toys for me? Her dad forced a smile and put on a brave face. It won't be so easy to get to that place. It's a risk, I've been told, but we just have to take it. They say over there, those who work hard can make it. They call it for all, para todos, because there, all hard workers are given a chance, fair and square. The people that built it came from all different places. It's clear when you look at their skin and their faces. The world's yummiest foods are found everywhere. All the world's languages float in the air. If we're homesick, said Flor, we can always come back. I'm not sure about that. Father's voice seemed to crack. They walked around knowing this would be their last time. First to the tree where Flora learned how to climb, then to the spot where her mother was buried. Who'll pull out the weeds and bring flowers, she worried. She looked at her home with a last loving glance. Dad said, we must go while we still have the chance. 
No matter what happens, wherever we live, be proud of our family. We have so much to give. Their journey was tiring, dangerous, and long, but Flora and her father had hope and stayed strong. There were deserts and rivers and caves and a train. They drank water from puddles and washed in the rain. They made it. Feet blistered, their clothes more like rags, and stared up in awe when they saw the great flags. The stripes of for all waved high in the air. They seemed to announce, we all come from somewhere, but now that you're here, we're one land united. As they got to the gate, Flora was proud and excited. The guard at the gate asked, where were you born? When Dad answered, he gave him a look of great scorn. He gave Dad two papers. Dad squinted his eyes. Did Dad understand them? Were they a surprise? Flor asked, why did we get those? What do they say? Don't worry, Dad said, and he put them away. Flor had glimpsed a red X, but did not tell her dad. Had they done something wrong? In school, X's were bad. When they finally arrived at their due destination, it was not what Flor dreamt of in her imagination. Their apartment was small with no garden, no pool. She felt lost and alone in her strange big new school. Dad came home every night, so achy and weary, played songs from his past, which made him get teary. Are you hurt? Are you sad? Dad, are you okay? Let's rest now, my love. It's been a long day. Flora found it hard to learn the new language. Her lunch felt all wrong. Couldn't dad make a sandwich? Flora tried to blend in. Being lonely felt sour. She said to her class, my name's Flor, which means flower. Kids exploded in laughter. You're named after the floor. Flora's cheeks turned bright red and they giggled some more. Flora knew other kids came from far away too. Was it easier for them? Did they know what to do? Every day Flora could feel her heart and head ache. Was coming to for all one big bad mistake? One day during recess, Flor sat on the grass. Miss Soto came up from her language arts class. She saw Flor was adrift and said, you're not alone. Your story reminds me a lot of my own. Flor said, it's so hard, they don't understand. I do, said Miss Soto, taking Flor's hand. I started like you. Coming here was a struggle. You'll soon feel at home. She gave Flora a snuggle. When I was your age and was stuck, I would write. And words would reach into the dark like a light. I want you to have this green pen, for I'm sure that writing will help you stay strong and endure. Flora began writing, first choppy and slow, but soon words gushed forth, filling row after row. She wrote of her journey the things left behind. She wrote of her dreams, all she hoped she would find. She could finally explain with the help of her pen how you ache and you grow when you're starting again. Miss Soto said, you have a story to tell. I'm sure other students have felt this as well. Put it in the school paper for others to read. Your words will help others who are also in need. And it did. Kids came up and told Flora, we read it. We feel the same way, and we're so glad you said it. Flora ran straight back home to tell Dad all about it. Things will get better, she wanted to shout it. But Dad wasn't home, again, working late. Flora stared at the window. It was so hard to wait. As night fell, she realized, I don't know where Dad is. I wrote down my story, but I don't know his. When dad came home tired and sat down to unwind, Flor asked all the questions she had on her mind. Why are you so tired with no time for fun? Dad said, work is hard when you're out in the sun. Last Christmas, you said we couldn't go shopping. Why don't you have money if you work without stopping? 
Your jobs are so hard, it doesn't seem fair. The boss takes the money. Why can't he share? Dad looked at Floor, his eyes crinkled with pain. He said, there is something I have to explain. Remember those pages we got long ago? I tried to protect you, but it's time that you know. He took out the papers they'd gotten before. With a low trembling voice, he read one to Floor. To all those that come to for all, be advised. Here are the rules so you won't be surprised. You can pick the strawberries or pounds of tomatoes, clean up the bathrooms and fry the potatoes. You can't get more money or work without pain. You'll get into trouble if you dare to complain. If you do, guards will come in no time at all. We can have you locked up and removed with one call. So if you speak up, they can take you away? Yes, Laura, I have to just do what they say. I know it's not fair, but I do it for you. If you study, then there's so much more you can do. Her dad seemed to trust things for her would be better, but Flora was afraid there was more to this letter. She saw one more page, which her dad didn't mention. Was that page about her? Flora swallowed the question. Flora put her green pen away, far out of sight. It wasn't enough to tell stories and write. Dad couldn't speak up, it wasn't allowed. It was safer for her to blend in with the crowd. Flora needed to use all her determination to get into school for a good education. For her next school, a test would decide. If Flora knew all the answers, they'd let her inside. Every day, Flora would study, learning slowly but steady. And when the test came, she was totally ready. She'd done it, her dad had been right to believe, for all really gave her the chance to achieve. The school would accept her with one big hooray. Floor planned her first day and what she would say. I'll go to the school to invent a new pill to help mothers like mine if they ever get ill. And to have a fair job, not like those of my dad. Then I'll buy him the things that he's never had. When she got to the school, she saw a big sign. If your papers have check marks, go stand in that line. If they have a red X, that means you should go. We cannot accept you. The answer is no. The guard said, I know your test score was great, but the orders I have say don't open the gate. If you are born here, then you belong. If you are not, you'll always be wrong. Our grandparents weren't born here. Yes, that is true, but we must draw the line and we draw it at you. Flora ran to her father and asked, did you know, did that paper list places where I cannot go? Yes, Flora, it said to all those that come, no, justice for all means justice for some. For me, it means jobs with hard work and low pay. For you, I guess, schools will now send you away. I hope that with time we would both be accepted and you'd be let in and I'd be respected. Floor said, oh, dad, I have so much to learn. You believed in para todos and now it's my turn. I have to help those in the same situation. Immigrants long to belong to this nation. I think the problem is people don't know that workers are tired, youth have nowhere to go. If they heard all our stories, I think they'd agree to be fair to the immigrants like you and like me. Dad said, I'm scared. Speaking out can be tough, but you're right. Working hard just isn't enough. We need to convince them to make a new rule, to work without fear and be led into school. Flo remembered Miss Soto and all her advice. She grabbed her green pen without thinking twice. She'd write down the stories of people she'd met who hadn't been able to speak up just yet. She started with dads and wrote it all down. Then she interviewed immigrants all over town. I'll go on TV and get out the word. Tell voters the truths that haven't been heard. The man at the station asked, why are you here? People like you never dare to come near. 
There are so many stories that I have to offer about the unfairness that immigrants suffer. Your viewers need to know the truth when they vote. They might change their minds when they hear what I wrote. If they know what it's like, I trust that they'll care. Vote for schools for all kids and jobs that are fair. Long ago, Flor had seen For All on TV. Now she knew that For All wasn't all it should be. But this was her home now. She felt loyal and proud. So she had to speak up, say her truth right out loud. Flor went on TV and got people's attention. She got them to listen and also to question. Immigrants should not be abused and left out. Justice must be what this country's about. When Flora finished talking, people called on the phone saying, we feel the same, you aren't alone. We also believe we can make this place better. United will change unfair laws all together. Flora couldn't believe it. There are so many others who stood up for each other like sisters and brothers. They told her, we know we are all one community. We are strong only if we believe in our unity. So Fleur joined with the group to give a big speech and together their voices had a much wider reach. You inspired us all to vote for new rules. We'll win justice for all in our jobs and our schools. What do you think is right in this situation? Should immigrants have a fair chance in this nation? Should all kids have schools where they study for free and workers get paid so they live comfortably? One day you will vote and make that big choice. So be ready to answer and lift up your voice. But for now, Flora is going around giving out pens. Even dad started talking about rights with his friends. Your moment will come, though you may not know when. So why not start writing? Pick up your green pen. Great, so I hope you really enjoyed those books, spending some time with us here at the Eastside Freedom Library on a Saturday morning. I bet you're as excited about spring as we are here, and so we hope after you've had a chance to hear these stories, you'll get outside and enjoy some of the beautiful weather. Thanks so much, and I hope we'll see you next week when Christy will be back to read to you. Thanks.